Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage. Today's interview is part one with the great Don McLean. We hope you enjoy it, and if you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Hope you enjoy it. Part one, Don McLean. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame with Don McLean. Thank you so much for being here, man. This is great. I've been wanting to do this a long time. Thank you very much. I really appreciate I mean, I really do appreciate that. Thank you. So, like I, like I ask everybody that's a player, how, what made you want to play? Man, what? Um, Elvis Presley made me want to play. Um, when I was 1956, I was 11. And I never thought I could ever play. Uh, and, and what I did was I started small. There was a, a fellow that lived behind us, uh, and he and his wife were friends of my parents. He was kind of holed over from the um, raccoon coat 20s, yeah. and he had a, a baritone ukulele, which was almost like a guitar. And he would play, I don't care if the sun don't shine, and some of these raggy little tunes. He was a sweet, nice man. And he, he said, well, I'll, I'll show you how to you know, play a couple of chords on this. So I figured I was halfway to the guitar with that, you know. And the funny thing was that my father, who was always, my dad was about as straight and conservative and reserved as some kind of farmer businessman would be. There was no room in his life for anything artistic. Uh, oh, however, he was very, he loved his home and he was always fixing it up and he knew how to do all kinds of things, you know, carpentry and electrical work and stuff. Not a kind of guy to, oh, let's go to a show, let's go to a concert. No, that wasn't my father. So, but the funny thing was, I said, can I get a baritone ukulele? Because it's almost like a guitar. He said, why don't you go all the way and get a guitar? <laughs> so actually, my father is the one who got me to take that step, even though he, re I'm sure he regretted it later, because uh, it took over my whole life, you know, and um, no time for school, no time for anything, all kinds of unusual people coming to the house who played in rock and roll bands around New Rochelle and stuff and uh, but yeah though so that's so I how old, how old were you then 12 maybe and uh, you know there was always this kid here or that kid there that had a, a stratotone you know well one of those cool guitars from uh, monkey wards or Sears right and they're very popular now actually because they're funky instruments and it was music was everywhere in Neurochelle. Everybody, you know, we would get together and hear records. You didn't get a record and listen to it by yourself. You know, you'd say, oh, I got this new Everly Brothers, come on over, and you'd have about four or five people come over and listen to the thing. What do you think about that? Oh, I like that track, or well, that's good, or, you know, they don't like it. So then, the folk music thing happened at the same time as, as rock and roll, but rock and roll and folk music were very similar. They just were drums, but it was three chords. And certainly the Everly Brothers sang a lot of country folk type things with a beat. Um, Elvis did the same. Um, so you could play Don't Be Cruel and you could play This Land Is Your Land, you know, you could play anything you wanted on your guitar and pretty much be with everything. Also, the charts had everything on them in those days. There was none of this snobbiness, you know, about, oh, we're rock and roll, or we're blues, or whatever. You know, you'd hear Percy Faith, and then you'd hear the Everleys, you'd hear uh, Little Richard, and you'd hear Elvis, but then you'd hear Andy Williams, or, you know, Sinatra, uh, whatever. So, it was very democratic. 
and I was ill quite a bit, so I was had asthma, so I was, and I get pneumonia. And the reason was, of course, and we found this out, I found this out many years later, every, I had a, a grown sister, 15 years older than me, and I had a mother and a father and a grandmother, and the four of them smoked all day long, closed the windows. So they were killing me. And they didn't even realize, killing themselves too. But that was what was doing it, you know. Um, if they'd smoked outside and kept the windows open, I wouldn't have gotten sick. Mm -hmm. But it would lead to pneumonia, and then I'd be down for a month, two months, lose all contact with kids, school. In fact, this pandemic is a little bit like I remember it. You know, I'm, I'm up doing little things that I want to do. I'm cool with it because I've been there before, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was so sick that if you told me that I would be, 50, at age 24, I would start on like a 50-year career and do thousands and thousands of one-nighters all over the world. You know, everybody would say, are you kidding? You know, the kid can't, uh, you know, can't make school. So you just never know the longevity and the energy that you have. But the, so the guitar meant, you know, and music was everything, and the radio and the records and, but it was, and I was thinking, you know, as I grew, the big thing to me were music stores. So in Nourishell, we had one music store, the House of Music, and that was on Main Street. And that's where the three theaters were. And we would always go to the House of Music. You know, anytime I went to Nourishell, it's the first place I'd go. And I knew people there. And she had Gretsch guitars. That was her thing. You never saw Gibson, you never saw Martin. You had to go to New York for that. So, uh, but that was my place, you know, where I'd go and say, oh, wow, look, new records came out or, you know, so much fun. Also, I would get gear, you know, strings, finger picks, things like that for the guitar once I started playing. What kind of guitar did your dad get you? Well, the first guitar I got was a Harmony. It was uh, actually, it's, if you ever watch Mance Lipscomb uh, on YouTube, he plays exactly the guitar that I had, which was like, it looked like a triple O 21 or triple O 18 Martin. So that's that style. Mm -hmm. And I also, before that, I had an F hole orchestra one mm -hmm. that I put a pickup in. And that, that one I would play with, uh, you know, I was able to play rhythm guitar in, in rock and roll bands that were around. So I had one friend who was very musical and he had a band, they had all these Fender e equipment, you know, and, We'd be in his basement, you know, and playing um, Caravan and Pipeline, and they were way into all the, you know, the ventures type things. So, you know, it was a constant. Um, I'll remember this kid I used to know. He was a rich kid, very nice. Had a beautiful house, like a Tudor mansion almost. It's where I lived in Nourishell. There were some really nice houses. So I knew this kid, and I would go and visit him. He was older than I was. And, you know, I'd go over there, and we'd hang out and whatever. I went over there one day. He was dancing, like, all over the place. And Little Richard had just hit. And it transformed this guy into this athletic, dancing, wild person, you know. And then a friend of mine, I wasn't a New York person. You know, I was a suburban kid. I, I didn't know the city. I didn't like the city. But I had friends that had moved up who had lived in the Bronx before they came to New Rochelle. And they would see Brooklyn, uh, the Alan Freed, Brooklyn Fox uh, shows that had all the acts on there. Jackie Wilson and the Five Satins and the Everly Brothers. And, you know, they had 20 acts. The place would go batshit. And they'd come home and they'd be juiced. You know, I said, what's the matter with you? Oh, man, you shouldn't have seen this, blah, blah, blah. So I wish I had seen it. You know, but I, I didn't, New York gave me the creeps. So I had to get introduced slowly to it, you know. When did you play your first gig in front of an audience? Um, well, I teamed up with a couple of kids who were New Yorkers. I didn't drive. One of the, yeah, I didn't drive till I was 19. I kept failing the test. A terrible driver. And so everybody was always having to drive me around, pick me up and stuff, you know. And um, 
So this one friend of mine who became a tremendous banjo player named Mike Kropp, uh, we became good friends. He had this huge house. I love houses, I love architecture, because I was always housebound in a tiny house. So the idea of being housebound in an enormous house was a thrill for me. You know, I could wander around, you know, and so I, I have a, huge houses that I own now because of that. I don't like to be in a, a little place. So he took me to New York and we formed a little group, a little folk group, and we did some terriers. I don't know if you've ever heard of the terriers. They were a folk group. Initially, we were um, at Alan Arkin and uh, Eric Darling and a guy named Bob Carey, and they had a hit, the Banana Boat song in 1956. Mm -hmm. And there were several different versions of the terriers. And so we would do some of their songs, and we played a Israeli coffee house. Got a job. It was the first job. That was it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, you, 1961. You, you, uh, you were friends with Pete Seeger, right? I was. I knew Pete Seeger for, well, I knew him his whole life, but I started writing to him in junior high school. Because, Why? Because I was interested in his politics. I was interested in his history. I knew he'd been blacklisted, and I was going to try to find out why. I liked his records. I liked the way he played. I liked the songs that he sang that were very diverse and interesting. I liked the idea of having ideas in your head and a guitar and a banjo on your back and that's all you needed. You just spread your ideas out and then you don't need anything. And when, if the band can't make it or something and all I do is just perform, I don't need anything. And do the same thing as I would if they had, it, it turns out just like the same as if the band were there. So I gradually got to know him, yeah, but it was a long process. But he was always writing me back. He wrote everybody back. Might take you six months or a year to hear from him, but he'd get around to it. And always with a little word of wisdom or this or that. One of the things I remember, he said, don't learn too much. Learn a few things very, very well instead of trying to be all over the place, learning a lot of things half well. Did he mean that as musically or just in general? Um, musically, but it's a great, it's, in general, it's a good advice anyway. Learn things well. Learn how to do something so it's so, you're so sure of it. And he was also, uh, I remember once saying, he, you have to have idiomatic mastery. In other words, I have 10,000 songs in my head. I can pick up a guitar and do anything I want with it. Go anywhere I want with it. I don't have a set list on my guitar case because that's not idiomatic mastery. That's a, you know, a step one, step two, step three. That's a, but mastery is you go out, start with whatever song you want, go to the next one, what do you think about that? I have a story to tell here, move over to this one over there, oh, I'm gonna try this one, you know. And I like sometimes trying one that I, is difficult that I haven't tried in maybe years and just do it and see if I fail and say, oh well, I'll find a way out of it, you know. One thing that um, Pete Seeger said that I, I thought was great was um, think globally, act, yeah. lo act locally. Mm-hmm. And I think if everybody did that, they would take care of their own backyard and wouldn't have to worry about... Well, he morphed into an ecology f period which occupied the rest of his life. He was, in the beginning, there was civil rights and the ban the bomb and all these important things, you know, when they were really... And then he moved as those things got going. By the time I got to know him in 1966, uh, he was well into the environmental phase and he just didn't do it himself. I mean, he would have speakers come to these shows that we did who were uh, scientists and poets and I mean, it was rich. And I think it was the best time of my life in terms of being stimulated by really smart people who were around. Everybody was very creative. I can't imagine what it took to, to build that boat and go up and down and save the Hudson, I well, I, I was in the, we, we went out with me and two other acts in February of 1968. 
to just sort of spread the word that they were going to do this. They'd started building it and raising money for it in 1966. And I saw the first show they did to try to do that. I was 20. And so by the time I'd managed to get next to him, and he chose me, asked me if I'd come along with these two other guys, and we did about four or five shows in New England. And, um, and then the following year, he put a group together of sort of ragtag folkies, you know, and sort of intellectuals and stuff. And, and we were on the thing when it got launched and sailed it all the way down to New York City. That had to be great. Yeah, it was very, very interesting. Especially when you're out there in the middle of nowhere, you can't see any land, and you see a whole bunch of reindeer swimming. You get a new respect for how strong a deer is and no how kidding. much they can do. Yeah. So I, I've lived in the woods my whole life. I lived in upstate New York for about 20 years when that whole thing was going on. And then I managed to go up to Maine and live there for another 25 years. Yeah, you know, in a big place in the woods. I like the forest. I like I like that. And I ride my horses and stuff. I don't do that anymore. Now I'm out in the desert and I've got a whole different life. And I really love that because I love the West. And that's that's the final phase of my life is to stay out there and you know, have both coasts, but I love horses in the West and I'm way into all that and I have been all my life. So a whole other thing, you know. What got you to writing songs, man? Well, well, like everything, see, the way I was brought up, it, it was don't do that, or you, you can't do that, or that's not something you want to do. No, you know, a lot of no. Right. And it took a long time for me to start to say yes to myself. And being around some very creative people really opened that door to where it transformed me into, into somebody who said, you can do anything. Use this brain of yours. Mm -hmm. Don't say no. Mm -hmm. You can do it, you know. So, um, you know, I one day, I forget what it was, I said, I'm going to try to write a little thing on my guitar. So I wrote kind of a song, you know, a, an instrumental. And then I... A little some words. I wrote a little simple song. I, I I I listened to the things like well, songs were simpler anyway. I listened to Woody Guthrie. I mean, it's pretty direct language. There's nothing fancy about his, what he has to say. It's very profound, but it's not fancy. So if you got something to say, you can say it. Say it out, you know, and write a chorus and and just throw the chorus verse chorus verse approach to start off with. <laughs> And then, you know, as I grew, I began to do uh, all sorts of, because I was influenced by the Beach Boys, by the Beatles, um, and Dylan and all that, and I started to get farther out lyrically and farther out in the construction of the song. So a song like The Grave, you know, is a very different song, you know, or Vincent. These. So, you know, I was taking all kinds of chances because I know if I'd go in the studio... I could hear the strings. I could hear the parts I wanted, sort of like Brian Wilson does. I couldn't write the parts, but I knew damn well if it was wrong. And that's got me in a lot of trouble. You know, I said, well, isn't this wonderful? I said, actually, it's not, because it ain't right. Yeah. Here's what I want. You know, so everybody get their feelings hurt, you know, and uh, I didn't want to hurt anyone. I just wanted to get at what I was after. I mean, we, we must have sent three months trying to get the guys to play American Pie right. Well, hey, why don't we take a break, and when we come back, sure, we'll talk about how the American Pie was recorded. Sure. All mm -hmm. right? We'll be right back. Welcome back to Musicians Hall of Fame with Don McLean. So, Don, we were just got to actually how American Pie, how you work in the studio, actually. And so go ahead, if you would. Well, the studio side of things, everything that I did when I started out had to be played off the guitar. And that continued on uh, pretty much. And then um, I realized that I was in this world where I could do anything I wanted to do. I could have strings, I could have voices, I could have nothing, you know, I could have all sorts of stuff. But I wasn't anxious to overdo things, you know, I wasn't 
I love Phil Spector, but I wasn't trying to do that. But um, I wanted, like, there's a song on the Tapestry album called Bad Girl, and it's got a, a, a sort of a little rocky type of a thing, and then it goes into a middle part, and it becomes the strings, and you start to think about the, what's going on with the girl when she was a little girl, and this and that, and the violin. All this stuff was in my head, you know, and I couldn't do it really on the guitar anymore, so I had to sort of work more into getting. But still, not away from the guitar ever entirely, you know, because I was always able to, to do it. You have to have a melody, and you have to have a, a, a cohesive lyric that you, that you, you can... Uh, that has an identity. And so you can do almost any song of mine with just the guitar. But there are a few that are difficult, like a song called The Statue, which is on the Primetime album. And that is just a string section that comes in. And I sing this song, and it's almost uh, classical music, which I cannot play. So I would have these moments, you know, where I would have these thoughts that I couldn't possibly begin to play the guitar on this. So we would just have a guy write some beautiful string, string arrangement, the statue. It's about the Statue of Liberty. Um, so, you know. Um, did you actually produce it more than, or did, you ha did your producer have a lot of input, or was it yeah. mainly you? Yeah, producer had a lot of input. The producer would find the musicians. The producer would, uh, Ed Freeman had a lot of input. Um, I didn't know where to find musicians. I just knew what I wanted, and I knew what I didn't like. And Ed was great at finding piano players. He knew them all. And we had some great ones. <clears throat> and he, he had that sense. Paul Griffin? Is that right? Paul Griffin was the guy that really made the American Pie um, track come together. We've been in rehearsals for a long time. And some of the rehearsal tapes I thought were better than the record. Looser. You get in the studio, you get tense, you know. That's an art form, to be able to get in swing, you know, and you don't care. You don't care what it costs, you don't give a damn. That's a hard thing to do. You've got to learn to do that. So in those first few records, I was a nervous wreck, you know. I'm trying to get this stuff done. and Not a good attitude to have. Uh, in the studio, because you got to be cool, you got to be happy, you got to be loose, and that's when your good stuff happens, mm. you know. But I've so Paul, uh, we, we, what was happening was <laughs> you get like a dong 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 dong. I said, no, man, that sounds like you know polka music. It's not right. So he comes in. He says, and I'm really bashing the guitar, which is what I would do. I, I had spent so many years playing in rallies and, you know, fields and festivals and stuff. I beat the crap out of the guitar when I played it. You know, I set it up high, too, so it would be as loud as it could be. Still do. And Paul said, man, when I heard that guitar, I knew what I had to do. And so we went right into playing that sort of crazy, wonderful stride gospel piano whatever it is that's it everybody followed now when you say set it up high you didn't mean the action you mean the the chord did you no i mean the action oh, the action okay it's set up like i set it up like a bluegrass guitar okay yeah so it wouldn't rattle yeah, yeah. did you know david spinoza before you booked him on the set i did not know david spinoza um i didn't know any of those guys and i didn't particularly like him because i spent so long telling them they couldn't play the song you know, but they turned out to be great guys. And uh, I was, you know, I had my own problems. You know, I had my own, they had a chip on their shoulder, I had a chip on my shoulder. You know, yeah. And so, you know, you get in, you, that's not the way to do things, you know. Well, evidently, it worked, you worked it out, you know, because. But you're not getting respect. Mm -hmm. You know, but when you're starting out, and you've got guys who've done so many projects and you're this newbie, yeah. you know, that's why you don't get respect. But right. I thought I deserved respect because I had a vision. I knew what I was doing. And, uh, oh, they'd seen that before too, you know, so they'd seen everything before. So there was that. But little by little, we started to make progress. And uh, Well, as a songwriter, did you, um, 
What's your favorite song, regardless of sales or? Uh, oh God, that's a very hard question. Um, I mean, I can't answer that question. I I would have a favorite now and have a favorite an hour later. But the, the songs go back to. You know, my childhood. I, I think I stopped really learning probably when I was in my 20s. Stopped really caring about the music that was there like I had. I was, uh, I was a celebrity or whatever you want to call it. It was a burden. How old were you when, when you... 24 maybe. And I didn't... It, to me, it all changed. It became a... Uh, you know, something that had lawyers and, you know, people worrying about percentages. And I mean, I, I had a degree in this stuff in finance. I mean, I could, if I didn't go in the music business to do that, I could have gone into banking if I wanted to do that, right, you know, yeah. but the fun was over, you know, and it's never been as much fun as it was in the sixties up to the early 1970s. And um, the getting there was the most fun. It was. Because everything was new, everything you did, you never th dreamed you could ever do this, and it happened. You know, seeing things happen. You know, we live, uh, somebody said we have lives of quiet desperation. You know, I see quiet desperation more now than ever, of course. But I've always seen that. So they're afraid to say, hey, break out. I, wanna, I don't want to do this job in New York. I want to be a lumberjack, okay? I want to go to and work for a lumber company. I'm going to go to Pacific Northwest and I'm going to figure out how to be involved with and you know, be a, a lumberjack because I want to be outside, you know, and I want to smell wood and or I want to do something else, you know. People don't do that, you know, but you have to. If there's something you got to do, you got to do it because this is it. And that was the thing with me. Being a musician was almost like being a lumberjack or, you know, a cowboy. I would have been a cowboy. I'm sure I would have left home if I'd have been 1800 or something. I never would have come back. Mm. I would have just sat a horse and been happy to do it, you know, and learn those things. Did you write Vincent first or American Pie first? Vincent was first. That was, um, I was singing in a school system in, uh, in Massachusetts, and I was living uh, in a house called the Sedgwick House, which was a couple of doors down from Norman Rockwell's studio. It's funny. People would go to this place. Um, what was it called? Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Yeah. And the Sedgwick House, an old family, you know, from the Pilgrim days. And the lady that rented out her apartment was just this cool lady and very prep, you know, and but very hip, you know, and she was neat. She'd have different people like Yo-Yo Ma would stay there or somebody, mm -hmm. you know, and she got to know all these people. So I wrote it in this little area, which is, there was a garden outside, and there was a beautiful windows around, and reading this book, and I just started singing the song and writing it down on this green paper that I had and working on it. I would sing the songs right into the tape recorder. I still do, whenever I write songs. I haven't written a song in a couple of years. I'm not really interested in songwriting right now. But when I get around to it again, that's how I'll do it. How long did it take you to write, Vincent? You know, I don't know. It didn't happen in like 30 minutes? I mean, uh, was it? No, it wasn't like one of those. It was, it was thought out and um, picked over and, you know, half done and thought about, you know, before you take the next step. Because each step has got to be right. Well, what, what book were you reading that inspired that? Um, I actually have that book still. It was some sort of book by his brother Theo. I don't remember the exact title of the book, but I have it. See, I always imagined you looking at the picture and just boom, you know. You I to... gave the book away, uh, mm -hmm. a bunch of books, to a guy in Maine who was a good friend of mine. And he, he said, hey, man, i got to send you this back. You Look what you wrote in here. You want to keep this. And he did. It was nice of him to do. Yeah. When you went to the record label... Did you have 
the American Pie album written or just a couple of songs or? Well, I, the, it took me 10 years to write Tapestry. And I kicked off maybe 15 songs of that on that record that, that never ended up on the record. And then I started working on some more stuff and I realized I had six months to come up with the second one. And I'm not fast you know, by any means. So, you know, I was constantly working on it. And then the deal was going down, you know, the record company was failing. So I'm killing myself thinking all day and night about this. And the record company is going under. So I get the word, you know, right in the middle of this project. And, uh, well, Media Arts is going out of business. So I thought, oh, well, I'm back on the street. You know, here I go again. So at least I made one. And uh, so I didn't do anything for a while. And then I got a call. Oh, guess what? Uh, Media Arts is being bought by United Artists. So you're back in business. So way, hooray, you know. So I started <coughs> working on, you know, finishing some things. I don't remember the order. I really don't. Well, you know, everybody was going to want to know how how did the um, how did American Pie how long did it take you to write it what inspired you to write it and I have these ideas that are theories that I that I'll, sometimes I'll, I'll write a song for example the song Prime Time was written in 1976 and 76 around there and I, 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 I could see mechanical music coming. Before, you know, Devo and that, when they were doing all these things, I could see it happening. And I wrote this song about America as a game show and almost a little mad, madness, everything coming through the TV and all the music being made sort of by robots. And so there's an example, all right? Now, this is before this was happening. So in American Pie, I... I, I came up with the idea that politics and music influence one another going forward. So that as we become new beings throughout time with, with new accepted modes of behavior, uh, politics influ influences the music, music influences the politics, and it changes uh, uh, that way going forward. So it was a neat idea might have been wrong, but now as I look back over really all these years, it seems to be kind of almost right. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the reason perhaps while the song has endured because it's this forward movement with these things happening and moving sort of toward an apocalypse of some sort. And then the end is so anticlimactic, like a movie, I, I think in movie terms without realizing it because I think I was home so much that I, I I absorbed so much television and movies and stuff that I had that in my head. I want to be able to see the song. So I remember the March on Washington and when it was all over, it was just, a f it was rainy and everybody was dispersed and there was a few little noises here or there and it was just quiet in the streets. And that's what I tried to capture in, inadvertently at the end of that song. Mm -hmm. Like this big thing had happened and, and, and it's happened. And now it's just maybe a little rain is coming down and you know, I don't know where I came up with it. It just, I saw it and I wrote it. Everybody's always said it was, the song was basically about the plane crash with, with Buddy Holly and the big box. Well, that was the thing I carried with me. Um, I carried that event with me for years and years. And Buddy Holly had a, an emotional impact on me. As, to a lesser degree, Richie Valens, too, those songs he wrote. And those guitars. And... Um, so here I found a, a place for that and that expressing that 
as I did in the first part, opened up the idea of where I was going to go to get this other notion of politics and music going forward. You see, I had to have a, a place, a way to figure out how to get the vehicle for it. So I, I did it. And, um, you know, and, but then you, you know, we made a really good record of, of a good album with all sorts of good songs. And if you don't have that, you wouldn't be talking about this now. Because mm -hmm. the record is the key. And making a record, you can take a crummy song and have a great producer and they can make something out of it. It'll sound profound. You know, a lot of the songs I would, I've heard, I won't mention any names, but back in the 70s, they were produced so well and they sounded like they meant something. And now that I listen to them again, the lyrics are very transparent. They don't really say anything. So I was concerned about lyric content, you know, and use of words. So the, the uh, thing I read about you being a paper boy? Correct. It, that's true then? Oh, yes. The song is biographical, you know, and I'm an observer of all this stuff as it goes on. I'm not in the middle of it. I'm outside of it. I've always been outside of everything. I've never been accepted. You know, uh, the only place that ever accepted me was Nashville. The country musicians accepted me. They appreciated my singing. They appreciated my songwriting. They appreciated my performing, my guitar playing, all the things that I do. It's the only place I ever found any acceptance. Really? In other places, I was accepted because in pop music, I had songs like And I Love You So, which were standards. Right. So therefore I have an acceptance of the Sinatra crowd, you know. Rock and roll because of American Pie, because of other songs I've written, Headroom, Chain, Lightning, whatever. You know. Um, but Nashville, they took me home to dinner. You know. I used to go to Neil Matthews' house and I'd go to, you know, basketball games with his son and watch his son play. He, he was like a father to me, you know, like a real friend. And, and the same with uh, Gordon Stoker. Yeah. And, and, and the rest. You know, I, Louis Nunnally, I, I loved him. We made, we made a lot of records together, you know. And, um, you know, it was so amazing to do Crying, you know, and have a number one record with them singing in the background. And Bill Justice, you remember Raunchy, right, doing yeah. the strings. Right, yeah. People have no idea what a great string writer this guy was. Yeah. Was funny, too. And I took him all over to England. We did TV special over there. Played at Carnegie Hall a couple of times. So, you know, this was personal, you know, and I knew their kids and their sisters and problems and whatever. I mean, that's still one of the most... Influential and successful singles, I think, in in recording history. How did it change your your life? All of it, just like oh, it changed my life completely. Um, How did you handle it? Badly. 